By 1983, Heinz roam over the Afghan countryside at will, seeking targets of opportunity. Soviet pilots name themselves the Grey Wolves. The men they prey upon call them the Garbok, or boogeymen. We were told that we had free hunting, that we should go off and shoot any people not using official roads. But it wasn't right. What if a man in the desert is just moving to the nearest village? When we first came, some people felt okay about us. But in a year or so, that changed. For Soviet pilots, telling civilian from combatant is often difficult. For leaders in Moscow, the distinction is inconsequential. Kremlin planners devise a strategy that many call genocidal. are bombed to empty the countryside of the people who feed, clothe, and shelter rebel fighters. There were incidents where, you know, villages were taken out and just shot or bulldozed. That was a very common one where tanks would just run over uh, bodies. Quite a lot of documentary evidence came out about that. With, you know, children uh, <clears throat> buried alive through bombings, um, again, deliberate attacks against villages, sometimes as punishment for attacks by the guerrillas. Anything against land, community, faith, and honor calls for fighting to death. in the character of every Afghan. I mean, just to fight. And from the beginning, I had some friends here in the state. I told them that uh, the Afghans will fight to the last man. And they did, and I was not wrong. The Afghans respond to this escalation of violence the way they have for centuries, with mean, an implacable determination. The Afghans could travel on bread and tea and could travel for days, weeks, even months on this you know, very basic form of nutrition and just seem to have this extraordinary resilience for living on very, very little. We were escorting a column of cars along a mountainous passage uh, we saw nothing, then quite of a sudden uh, one car was set on fire, another car was set on fire, and still we didn't understand where from the fire came. Uh, and then it appeared that uh, Dushmans uh, were lying under camouflage fabric. And uh, from above, from our helicopters, uh, we couldn't distinguish them from the surrounding rocks. Sometimes you could have feel the wind of the blades of the helicopters on you while hiding. Uh, and they waited until that column uh, was near that at the firing distance. Uh, first uh, hit and set on fire the first car, then the last one in the column, and then methodically began uh, to extinguish uh, the whole column. I couldn't do anything, and I didn't uh, know where the fire came from. And that, of course, was uh, a major disappointment. For me, it was like a heart-throbbing experience. Like, what the hell? What do they experience when we were covering our heads under the fire, and those guys just sitting in this without anything they can do to protect themselves. Pilots spend much of their time flying convoy escort, and over time, earn the respect of many they are sent to protect. Their strongest bond is with the Helleborn troops they carry into battle. For airborne, it was like a twin brothers. And I especially respected that they never used their shoots 
when they were flying us for sorties. So if push comes to shove, we were in the same boat and they would not take any extra chances to save themselves or to leave us to just to drop us in the deep shit alone. Hind pilots often fly on what they call roadrunner missions, where, to present as brief a target as possible, they spend much of their time scooting just above the ground. Small arms fire poses little danger to the thick-skinned chopper. But by 1984, the Mujahideen learn a new trick. They take a weapon meant to penetrate the dense armor of Soviet tanks and point it skyward. Another unexpected thing we encountered there were the usage of uh, hand uh, grenade launchers against helicopters, which uh, were intended to fire uh, at tanks, but uh, at helicopters at low altitude. They had lots of grenade launchers, and a Moja head could just raise it and fire at you with a grenade, and there were many cases like that. You see, the, uh, the helicopters will come high. If you fire it like this, the blast will kill you, you or uh, at least injure you. So what we did, we will have these long, uh, tall trees, a poplar or some sort of a pine. On the top of it, a mujahid will climb and climb and climb. And usually, there will not be strong uh, branches to hold him. So what we will do, we will tie him up to the tree and then wait for the helicopters to come with the, with the RPGs. Over time, the Mujahideen, like the Viet Cong before them, learn that pilots notice movement. Running from incoming helicopters is suicidal. Once the guerrillas stand their ground, it is the Russians' turn to suffer. Hind pilot Valery Burkov entered combat in Afghanistan just two months after his father died flying an Mi-24 mission. Another Mi-24 was shot down, and my father decided to land his chopper and try and save the down crew. But when he was coming in, his hind two was hit in the fuel tank. So the helicopter exploded and started to burn. And he was the only one of the crew who didn't manage to get out. He burned up in the machine. A hit with multiple rounds in the fuel cell would cause a fire and subsequent force landing, catastrophic end of the mission. The Mi-24 is very heavily armored, applique armor plate, rolled steel up around the cockpit, except for the tail section, which is fabric. Fabric construction, easy to repair, but very vulnerable to, to even small arms fire. Eventually, the Heinz weaknesses begin to show. The altitudes in Afghanistan are extreme. Some Soviet fire bases sit as high as 18,000 feet. Here, the thin air takes its toll on turbine engines built to work no higher than 14,000 feet. Sometimes, this cuts the helicopter's speed by as much as two-thirds. More often, it means that the heavy, armor-plated machine cannot take off like a real helicopter, but must lumber down a short runway to get airborne. When pilots complain, Moscow and the middle company take no real action. Russia's idea was always to make a, a more cheap aircraft. The more, the better. The cheaper, the better. Uh, pilots were expendable. In the uh, Soviet communist ideology, people were expendable anyway. And the most expendable are the draftees, humping through the dust below. Now, most of these conscripts were non-Russian, ethnic Russian. They tended to be Georgian, Ukrainian, uh, from the Baltic states, Estonians, uh, Lithuanians. So there was a degree of resentment toward the Russians, toward Moscow. As I understand, Moscow tried to save more Russian kids because there was 